Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Nicola Vitossi. I am CEO of Fertility New Zealand, and it's my absolute pleasure to, to welcome you all. Fertility New Zealand is really pleased to host this uh, series of, of webinars. Um, we are a charity and we've been supporting Kiwis with fertility challenges for 30 years now. We've got a host of information which is all avail available through our website as well as through clinics. Uh, we have support groups which are meeting virtually at the moment but usually run in, in 12 different centres around the country. Um, and we also represent the voice of um, New Zealanders facing fertility challenges. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Peter Benny. He is Medical Director of Jenea Oxford Fertility in, in Christchurch. He's got a wealth um, of knowledge and experience and um, I'm sure it'll be a really informative talk. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Benny. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to type them into the uh, into the box during the talk. They will probably be answered um, at the end, but please feel free to, to ask questions. Thank you. Hello there. Uh, those who are observant might notice that outside through my window it's it's a little bit lighter than we through yours and I'm actually in Australia at the moment I've been put in a bubble in Australia for the last wee while but I'll be back to Christchurch as soon as they let me out of, out of things um, what I'm going to do today is just talk about recurrent miscarriage um, or it's often referred to as recurrent pregnancy loss. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the definition and you, you'll find that's a little confusing because there are lots of different definitions. We'll talk about the risk factors, the causes, how they're investigated uh, and, and, and the management. And then at the end, touch on the emotional impact. Uh, only uh, that I could spend the whole time just talking about that in itself. The definition of, in, of recurrent miscarriage uh, has changed a little over the years. Currently, there in, in the world that I live in, there are at least three different guidelines uh, that all have slightly different definitions. The, the, the guidelines that, that apply to uh, recurrent miscarriage in Australia and New Zealand uh, is uh, the, there's the one, the European one by X-ray. There's one which was made just in 2017. There's one, an ASR, ASRM, which is the American Society that was set up in, in 2013. And then, the, uh, and then there's a, the British College has one that they, it was about 2011. Um, so they, any of the definitions, are they're a little bit different and therefore you will find that it's a little bit confusing from time to time. So uh, recurrent miscarriage is, is not a particularly common problem in that it affects about 1% of the population. Although miscarriage itself is a very common event, uh, and probably about one in five or 20% of all pregnancies uh, will end in, in, in miscarriage. Recurrent miscarriage is classically referred to as the occurrence of three or more consecutive miscarriages. However, if you look at the, 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 the most recent guidelines, most of them have changed that from three to two. Uh, part of the reasoning for that is that if you investigate people after two miscarriages, your chance of finding a problem is about the same as finding its problem in people two out of, out of three miscarriages. Uh, so, uh, and, it, and it's for a lot of uh, couples, it's really very difficult to have to wait to have three miscarriages before 
uh, they get investigated. So nowadays, mostly, uh, certainly based on the European guidelines and the American guidelines, it's now classified as two miscarriages. Um, however, uh, that's uh, not the same as what's in the British guidelines, which is still sitting at three. The other thing that affects the definition is what is actually a pregnancy. Uh, the European one counts any pregnancy, uh, any uh, occasion when there's a positive uh, beta HCG. Uh, they don't actually set a, let, a set a level of that, so it's two beta HCGs, although they ex exclude ectopic pregnancies from that diagnosis. The Americans make the diagnosis of a clinical pregnancy, so that's one in which there's an ultrasound or histological evidence of a pregnancy. So uh, all of those will impact on uh, the, the number of, of miscarriages a woman will have, because a, a number of women will have a, a positive test but never have any other proof of it that there's been a pregnancy. Said about 1% of the population will have recurrent miscarriage, um, and they are a, a group who, um, who who go through quite a traumatic time. There are a number of risk factors for recurrent miscarriage. Probably the, the major one is, in fact, maternal age. But paternal age does impact on us as well, but maternal age is the, the most uh, important in this situation. If you have a look at the graph on on the left, this is looking at uh, the, the, the chance of pregnancy in, 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 or of live birth in, uh, uh, in, in women of different ages. And you'll notice that the chance that live birth declines as women get older. And part of that reason is that at the same time as the live birth going down, the risk of miscarriage is, is, is rapidly increasing, particularly after uh, the age of 40, uh, but around 35 it certainly starts taking off. Uh, so that the, 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 the risk of a, a woman in her early 20s of having recurrent miscarriage, uh, having uh, a, a miscarriage is really uh, uh, quite low, but a woman who, who's in over 45 who chances of having a miscarriage is really very high. Uh, and therefore, just by statistics, uh, women who are in their 40s are going to be significantly more likely to have two miscarriages or three miscarriages in a row. So, uh, so we, we can look, therefore, at the chance of a, 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 a miscarriage after so many pregnancies. So a woman who, if you look in the, the table at the side, a woman who uh, has never had a miscarriage, the chances of her having a miscarriage is, is about 10%. Uh, if she'd had one miscarriage before, it does slightly increase to, say, 20%. Uh, so that's it. after one miscarriage, the chance of having another is, is slightly increased. After having two miscarriages, it's, it, it's, it's, it's significantly more increased, uh, and not much more after three. Uh, but what that does say is that all of those, the chance of having a baby after one miscarriage, after two miscarriages, it's always going to be higher than the chance of having a miscarriage. There are some causes of recurrent miscarriage that are much more uh, repetitive. Um, uh, there are uh, chromosomal conditions where uh, normal pe people have one bit of one chromosome taken off and, and attached to another chromosome, and that bit on the uh, that chromosome goes back to the other one. So they, they have a normal amount of chromosome material themselves, but when those chromosomes go to split, to form a baby, uh, that, that some of those uh, pregnancies will get the wrong number of chromosomes because the, that when they split, bits go to the wrong wrong uh, cells. So if a woman has what we call a translocation, where a bit of one chromosome 22 gets stuck onto the other 22 chromosome, and a bit on that 22 chromosome gets stuck back on the other one, 
they if they've got that, they're very, very likely to have a miscarriage every time. So much so that when it does happen, people when they do have a live birth, people write them up. However, whether a, if a bit of chromosome 13 gets attached to chromosome 14 and a chromosome 14 gets attached to a bit of chromosome 13, those women or, or couples uh, will have a 25% chance of having a, a miscarriage. So, so the cause of the miscarriage does uh, tell how often the, a miscarriage is going to occur on the next pregnancy. So there are lots of different causes of, of miscarriage. Now I've already talked to you about structural chromosome anomalies and primarily those are um, uh, 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 translocations uh, and uh, which simply really means that a normal person has chromosomes, bits of one chromosome have been shut, swapped with a bit of another chromosome. And that doesn't affect that person because they actually have the right amount of chromosome material. But when those chromosomes split up, then there's this chance that one or an embryo will get the wrong number of chromosomes from that. The other causes, and probably the most common causes of all miscarriages, is that uh, the, the embryo ends up with the wrong number of chromosomes simply by chance. Now there are lots of different trisomies and monosomies, which means the embryo has uh, in say 47 chromosomes or 45 chromosomes. Uh, most of those will result either in no pregnancy or in a, in a miscarriage. Uh, but um, in some circumstances, they will result in, in, a, in a live born baby uh, when the chromosome abnormality isn't so severe. And that's what causes Down syndrome. So that is a severe chromosome abnormality, but it doesn't generally cause a miscarriage. There are a number of genetic disorders that are associated with miscarriage and I, I won't go on to talk about them too fully today. I won't talk about them. Uh, one of the th things that is associated with increased risk of miscarriage is uh, the, the presence of changes in the DNA in the sperm. Particularly in sperm of older men, sometimes there are breaks in the DNA and that's what we call DNA fragmentation. Uh, and that in itself can increase the risk of miscarriage uh, um, in, in, a, in a couple. And that may account for some of the increased risk of miscarriage related to older, older men. Other causes of miscarriage are related to the, 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 the shape of the uterus. Now the uterus forms from two tubes the two tubes join together in the midline and then the midline breaks down. So the cavity forms like that. But in some situations, the cavity forms are like a heart shape or in fact, it forms two halves. And in those situations, particularly with a septum right down the middle, there's a greater chance of miscarriage. The difficulty in knowing with those abnormalities is knowing whether to do anything about them because often you may not make things better. Sometimes fibroids protrude into the uterine cavity. Uh, so leiomyomas or uterine fibroids protrude into the cavity and they change the blood flow to the uterus, they change the shape of the cavity and increase the risk of miscarriage. Now some of those fibroids fall go right into the cavity as a polyp, they fill the cavity and they certainly uh, will reduce fertility and if fertility does occur, increase the risk of miscarriage. Other polyps will probably increase the lining of the, uh, in the risk of miscarriage, uh, but there is not all of them will. Interuterine adhesions are uh, when the one wall of the uterus gets stuck to another, so that the and so the cavity can't expand up, so it's stuck like that. Now, generally, interuterine adhesions occur after pregnancies, uh, particularly after. Uh, infected uh, problems with childbirth or with miscarriage uh, DNCs. They often will 
stop women from getting pregnant, and they, but they will sometimes increase the risk of miscarriage. So, as the uterus grows with a pregnancy, particularly when it gets beyond the first trimester before beyond 12 weeks, the, the cervix is very necessary to hold the pregnancy in. It's once been said that the reason humans can walk upright is that the cervix is able to maintain, to stay closed and keep the uterus closed while, and the pregnancy in there. But in some women, either after uh, surgery or sometimes congenitally, the, the cervix is not able to hold on to the pregnancy and the cervix opens up and every time the woman gets to around sort of over 12 weeks, they, 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 they miscarry. Now, we can deal with that by uh, suturing the cervix closed uh, and putting a loop around the cervix. Uh, and, and that's a, a, a less common cause of recurrent miscarriage, but it usually occurs in the second third of the pregnancy in the second trimester. There's been a lot of investigations and a lot of people have made their name out of immunological testing for recurrent miscarriage and infertility. There's certainly no doubt that antiphospholipid syndrome it, it, it causes recurrent miscarriage and that treating it will improve that. Phospholipids, if you, as you know, are, 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 are lipids, fats, with phosphorus, and they primarily role in the in in, in the body. Uh, to, they make up the cell wall. So if there's antibodies against the the cell wall, it, it increases the risk of miscarriage. Uh, uh, so we know that we can improve the outcome of uh, antiphospholipid with with interventions, and it's certainly something that needs to be investigated. But all the other things that have been uh, investigated and talked about are still very much research basis, and none of the guidelines will give them a lot of uh, credence. Uh, a lot of people will talk about measuring natural killer cells within the the blood uh, to, and relating that to the risk of miscarriage. The problem about natural killer cells is that the ones in the blood are not usually the ones that are in the uterus, and it's hard to relate the two. And it's none of the work that's been and done on the, those immune problems has never been ever been subjected to a randomised controlled trial, and it's very difficult to prove. The same applies to thrombophilias. Uh, factor V Leiden mutation is associated with miscarriage, although none of the guidelines that have currently been published say that treating anything, treating it will actually help. Uh, the same applies to prothrombin gene, which does seem to be increased in uh, gene mutation, which does seem to be increased in miscarriage. But again, it's difficult to prove doing anything about it actually improves the outcome. Uh, the same applies to protein C and protein S deficiencies. And the other is the NTFHR um, um, polymorphism um, or associated with homocysteine urea. Uh, it's been a very popular cause of, uh, of reproductive problems, but again, it's very difficult to prove that this is absolute, that intervention will make any difference and whether it is associated with a problem. Uh, we do know that women who have um, diabetes, particularly poorly controlled diabetes, are much more likely to miscarry. Uh, we do know that women who are significantly hypothyroid either don't get pregnant or, or have miscarriage, and certainly dealing with those are certainly worth the investigations. Uh, there's been a lot of thought about whether polycystic ovaries is associated with increased risk of miscarriage. It probably is a, so the, the problem is related to ovulatory, poor ovulation and probably a poor corpus luteum supporting a pregnancy. Uh, uh, there again, hyperprolactinemia, which is where the pituitary too much 
gene will stop people ovulating and all will make them ovulate ineffectively. And the same to luteal phase defect, although uh, it, it, it probably in itself isn't a problem. Um, but generally, if we've got a pregnancy with a lower progesterone, we, there is evidence that we could help it by adding progesterone support in early pregnancy. As I said earlier on, age is probably the most common factor and we can't do anything about that. Um, um, we can do something about BMI. We, there is certainly an increased risk of miscarriage in women with a higher BMI. Uh, smoking is also associated with recurrent miscarriage. Caffeine intake that will cause mis increased caffeine intake will cause miscarriage, but it has to be up around six cups a day. Um, um, certainly alcohol affects health and that affects general implantation. And, and there's a lot of talk about various environmental exposures, but I don't think we need to go and talk about that today. I've been through all of those investigations that all potentially cause the recurrent miscarriage. But over half of the court miscarriages, even if you investigate for all of those things that I've talked about, half of them won't, we won't find a cause. And for a lot of women, that's really very uh, um, uh, difficult. Um, so um, what I'd like to do is just now look a little bit at what actually happens when, a, when a, uh, an embryo goes into the uterus. When the embryo goes into the uterus, it's usually surrounded by a, a shell uh, um, called the zona pellucida. And one of part, the first part of the process of implanting in the uterus, the embryo has to hatch out of that shell. At that time, the uterus and the embryo communicate with each other. We don't know what the messages are. It's probably related to some of the DNA products that are excreted by the embryo. But based on that information, the uterus decides whether it likes that embryo or not. And the uterus acts as an embryo sorter. If it likes the embryo, it then does nothing and allows the embryo to invade the wall of the uterus. But if it doesn't like it, it then it puts up a barrier against it. And so what we get uh, is uh, something like this. So up this side of this table is is this re reproductive success. So, uh, and along the bottom is whether the uterus likes the embryo or not. Now, a uterus, it's very receptive that takes any embryo that comes its way. Uh, a lot of the embryos will implant, but a lot of them are not really suitable for an ongoing pregnancy. And these are often those women who have recurrent miscarriages, uh, but every time they try to get pregnant, they get pregnant. And what's probably happening in this situation is that the uterus is, is so receptive that even, every embryo will, uh, will implant. But we know uh, that um, not every embryo that's made in IVF will have a potential to implant. There's only a few in a, in a group of eggs that, or embryos that are made that have any chance of pregnancy. Uh, but if, if we put uh, embryos back into the, these women, every embryo will implant, they'll get a positive test and then it'll stop. So in the middle, there are people whose uterus has, is relatively good at selecting and relatively selective. And at the other end of the chart are the people who we have difficulty trying to get pregnant because their uterus are so fussy they won't take anything. Now, a lot of the women who are having recurrent miscarriage in this group will get the right embryo at some stage and will go up in success and have an ongoing pregnancy. But the problem is that for some women that takes quite a long time and a lot of heartache. So what we do if we're faced with recurrent miscarriage is obviously we need to go through a history and, just, 
discuss what happens with their pregnancy. Uh, and, and then we have to think of rational investigations that are going to provide us with information and don't cause undue expense to everybody. Because about 5% of women will have a chrome, or couples will have a chromosomal cause of their miscarriage by a translocation, then it's important in all of the, these to do a karyotyping of both parents. It's also in, in the guidelines that are out that suggested that in women who have more than one pregnancy loss, it pays to try and look at the products of the pregnancy and see what the chromosomes are of that pregnancy. Uh, commonly in women who are having a one and only miscarriage, those embryos will have the wrong number of chromosomes. However, the more miscarriages a woman has, the more likely those chromosomes, those embryos are going to have normal chromosomes. Uh, but it does pay to know what the chromosomes are in terms so that we can advise and, and help guide people through things. It's also important to check whether the uterus is normal, whether there are fibroids, whether there's a septum. Uh, um, and, and then we can then guide a rational treatment. As I said to you, uh, antiphospholipid uh, anti syndrome is, is a, a thing that we do need to test. It's an autoimmune condition and we can test for anti-cardiolipin antibodies, which make up some, most, a lot of the cell wall. Um, those antibodies are produced by the woman, uh, sometimes in response of a previous infection, sometimes spontaneously. Uh, we also need to check for anti-thyroid antibodies because that affects thyroid function. Um, and um, certainly when a pregnancy is implanting in the uterus, a woman needs a lot more thyroid hormone. And if they've got antibodies, they may not be able to respond to that and are more likely to have a miscarriage. <clears throat> Most people will check on a woman's ovarian reserve uh, to make sure, uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, to, to see how much time they've got. Uh, and by that, I mean, if someone's running low on their ovarian reserve, then it's, it's more urgent to move forward uh, than, than uh, someone um, who has a really good ovarian reserve and doesn't want to rush things. Uh, and that we do other tests in, in terms of uh, if, if they're indicated. Uh, in the past, it's, people have always done torch screen, which is an infectious screen. Um, the evidence would suggest now that it, it's not necessarily a very useful investigation, unless there's a, a strong history of infection relating to the pregnancy loss. Uh, it is important to rule out any uh, uh, sexually transmitted infections, just uh, because they can compromise the the, uh, the outcome of pregnancies. As I said earlier, uncontrolled diabetes increases miscarriage. Uh, most of the guidelines would suggest that we need to measure, do some test to screen for diabetes. And the common one suggested now is to do a, a, a glycated hemoglobin. I alluded to before about MTFHR uh, polymorphism and it's associated with miscarriage. Uh, if the mutation is, uh, if the polymorphism is significant, then the women will get an increase in their homocysteine levels in their blood, and, and that does affect blood flow to the uterus, blood flow to other parts of the body as well. Uh, uh, the, the, a lot of the um, path labs in New Zealand don't now measure the polymorphism. They, they uh, would just rely, would only ever do it if there's an elevated homocysteine. Uh, whereas other parts of the world that's done, uh, home, uh, this MTFHR polymorphism is, uh, is the routine test. I have done over the years a lot of natural killer cell investigations. I have not really found that it's been very useful in my management of people, although there are people around the world who make a lot of, have, make a lot of uh, um, call for the investigation of natural killer cells, but as I said to you early on, 
none of their studies have ever been subjected to randomized controlled trials, and it's hard to prove that it makes any difference. Really. Uh, you can look for natural list cells on an endometrial biopsy, and again, uh, I've done a lot of that over the last 10 years. Uh, very seldom is it helpful in terms of a diagnosis of recurrent miscarriage. Uh, but it sometimes helps in looking for identifying uh, low-grade infections within the uterus, uh, and some endometritis, and the, uh, in the future, it will probably be that we'll be looking at the microbiome of the uterus, which will actually probably have some basis on the current miscarriage. Anti-nuclear antibodies is another autoimmune condition, uh, and I uh, talked to you earlier about uh, DNA fragmentation. So the management of recurrent miscarriage is, is difficult. It's a frustrating problem because a lot of the time we don't know what, whether there's a problem. Certainly if there is a, a genetic abnormality in terms of a translocation or there's recurrent evidence that, uh, that um, um, the recurrent uh, evidence of uh, trisomies in the, in the fetal material, and then there is a place for, for treating those with uh, IVF and pre-implantation pre genetic testing uh, um, and, and looking for, the, for normal chromosome em embryos uh, and also for, for checking uh, uh, in some situations the chromosomal abnormality is such that we have to consider donor gametes in that situation. Certainly, that I've already talked about antiphospholipid syndrome, and that's certainly helpful. And there is some evidence for some people that surgery for uterine abnormalities is helpful. But all of the guidelines say that that isn't absolutely a certainty, uh, and one has to be careful in the choice of who gets surgery because sometimes if you operate on the wrong people, you end up making things worse and causing lots of interuterine adhesions. For the people who have no cause for their miscarriage, um, the ones, the 50%, uh, we do need to look at their lifestyle and see whether those are impacting on their outcome. Uh, we do, uh, and, and looking at a healthy diet and looking at weight reduction, um, there is some evidence to suggest that vitamin D deficiency is associated with uh, more problems with miscarriage. Certainly uh, smoking and alcohol and caffeine are important to, to discuss. Uh, whether rest and relaxation is of use. It certainly helps people to, to deal with the, the, the emotional trauma of what they're going through. Um, there isn't any strong evidence on which is the right diet. Uh, for fertility's sake and an, an ongoing pregnancy, it does seem that a diet that's more based on a Mediterranean style, uh, with particularly with lots of green vegetables, does probably improve the outcome of pregnancies. Uh, but it may it's hard to prove because in these situations, up to 70% of the next pregnancies will result in a normal outcome. All of the, the guidelines support the use of care and, and um, continual support of the, the, the women going through the pregnancy. There is some evidence that that actually changes the, uh, the immune response to the pregnancy. And certainly if people are cared for and, and followed closely, even if the pregnancy goes wrong, then they do have a better emotional outcome from that because they feel supported and, and informed. So one of the things that happens with all of the miscarriages is that you should have careful ongoing care from people that you trust. So I'd like to finish at this point, just I've already alluded to the 
emotional uh, impact of pregnancy, uh, of recurrent miscarriage. For every woman and every man, their response to this is different. And sometimes between couples, the response to it is different and may cause some upset. Uh, sometimes the outcome for the woman is made worse by what happens at the time of the miscarriage uh, or their management within hospitals and things like that, because that really does sometimes uh, add a more traumatic uh, uh, component to the, the, the pregnancy loss. And there are work, women and men who do suffer from PTSD related to miscarriage. For other people, uh, all they really want to know is when they can get on again and start again. Uh, I don't have any set rules about when to start for another pregnancy, but I do want people to be as emotionally secure as they can be before they start, because if, if they're in a bad place when they start trying to get pregnant again, and another pregnancy loss occurs, then that does make life quite difficult. So I'll leave that at this point, uh, and I'll just uh, go through some of the questions. Uh, uh, the, the question is to whether uh, maternal age is still a risk factor uh, reproductive um, uh, for recurrent miscarriage uh, with PDS. Uh, no, if, if the maternal age does reduce the number of embryos that are available uh, with normal chromosomes. Um, so, but if you find an embryo that has the right number of chromosomes, uh, uh, then um, that embryo has as good a chance of implanting uh, and resulting in an ongoing pregnancy uh, for um, th th than, than anyone else. Uh, so, maternal age does reduce the effectiveness of PTS because of the availability of good quality embryos. But if you get a good embryo, then you can generally will overcome that. Uh, I'm, some advice for someone who's had four miscarriages with genetically normal embryos, 36 year old with a low AMH of 5.2. Uh, as I said earlier on, uh, as women have more miscarriages, they're more likely, those embryos are more likely to have normal chromosomes. Uh, so uh, what the question is, is, is it's quite a common situation for someone who's in that situation. Um, so in this situation, PD, uh, pre-implantation genetic testing is not going to make a huge difference of the, uh, to the outcome. There isn't any absolute answer, and if provided everything else has been excluded in terms of autoimmune uterine abnormality. Um, uh, and the only real advice, which is the, the hard thing that people want to know, is that you really actually just have to keep trying. But that's, uh, that's sometimes very hard and, and often impossible. Um, um, because the lower AMH um, just means that the time you have available is, is reduced. Um, the chance of fertility is, is, is going to be lower. Um, but if there are normal embryos and you've excluded everything else in the situation, that's the really only option. Uh, anything you try in that situation is empirical because you don't have an answer. Now, and so in your experience, how many people with recurrent uh, pregnancy loss have gone on to actually to have a baby? So that's if we follow the diagnosis of uh, 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 the definition of two or three miscarriages, uh, the, the data would suggest in, in that situation
that up to 70% of them will have, uh, an, uh, have a baby. Um, uh, so, and that's really my experience. I mean, uh, there's been, it's a long, hard haul, uh, and we do spend a lot of time seeing people on a weekly basis, uh, scanning. We do try various empirical things, but there's, there's no evidence that they make any difference. But I think there is evidence that support uh, and looking after people does actually help the outcome. So uh, I think the majority of women uh, will get there unless there's some absolute factor that's causing the problem and that can't be treated and it can't be treated. So uh, now, great. I'm not the world's best reader. That's not my, I'm, uh, it's not my forte. Uh, I managed to get this far, but I'm, that's not really my forte. Uh, I'm asking on behalf of a friend, age 31, who's had one miscarriage 10 years ago, so she's 31 now, and five in the last one and a half years, more recently, uh, three weeks ago. All between, all between several and 12 weeks, all between uh, several and 12 weeks gestation, it has been cleared medically, any suggestions from my distraught friend? So I think probably grace that I have answered most of that. Uh, if there's no medical indication um, um, that, that and uh, that, that there isn't any any evidence of chromosomal abnormalities in the embryos, um, then there isn't any absolute thing that we can do. In this situation, if I was talking to your friend, I would cover with her the option of doing IVF with pre-implantation genetic testing so that she would know whether she's getting an embryo with normal chromosomes put back into the uterus. But it, it's, it, it's the hard bit of the whole job. Uh, so I don't have any absolute answers to, for her. Uh, um, I would be good to know what the investigation showed and everything, but if there's no absolute causation, then it's probably worth doing some empirical treatment, and one of those would be considering doing IVF. Okay. So, uh, so the next question is from Amy. Uh, I'd love to know your thoughts on on the medication progesterone pessaries. I am 28 years, six losses, all before eight weeks. Where have we gone up there? Okay. So far, all the tests, including carotiding me and my partner, have all been normal. I've recently been seen by a specialist and they're not interested in placing me on this medication. However, I've heard so many success stories for the situation. I'm willing to try anything, and I'm sure you are. Uh, and being told it's hard to wait and keep, just to keep trying. I think you can understand, I hope, from what I've said, that the why people say to keep trying, but it must be really very hard in your situation. When I'm seeing someone with in an early pregnancy, particularly someone who's had um, a, a mis one or two miscarriages beforehand, I'll always measure the HCG and the progesterone so that the progesterone gets measured at the same time as the HCT. So, and that applies to a, a IVF pregnancy, it applies to um, uh, ovulation induction pregnancy. Now, I mentioned a little bit earlier about people with polycystic ovary that there was a back in, well, I've been around for a fair while, it was probably near 25 years ago now that people were talking about polycystic ovary with high LHs and they seem to do better if they had progesterone. Um, there is a little bit of evidence to suggest that in people who have poor luteal function but are able to get pregnant, uh, that they may benefit from having uh, progesterone. Certainly in your situation, I wouldn't have thought there was any harm in doing it. Uh, it would be good to monitor your progesterone early in the pregnancy and then, then take some progesterone. Uh, I certainly uh, 
and wouldn't be averse to that. It, all you're trying to do is to give a, a better support of the lining of the uterus to hold on to the pregnancy. Um, uh, and, and certainly we use a lot of it. It, it doesn't, doesn't do any harm to the pregnancy. So you know, in your situation, uh, I wouldn't be averse to that, uh, but I'd have to go and say that I can't say it will absolutely do any good. Uh, okay, and now I'll go on to Victoria. I've had three miscarriages in a year. My first child, who is, who has T21, was born by emergency caesarean section, the caesarean, uh, and we're experiencing second and secondary infertility. I had a DNC with a, with a second loss and the baby had um, trisomy 15. Well, um, other miscarriages uh, are unexplained. Um, I've had my thyroid checked and, and a normal uh, antiphospholipid anti testing. Uh, what further uh, recommendation testing would you do? So you, you, you grow, you're a little bit more experienced with life than some. Uh, um, so that will increase your risk of miscarriage. Uh, you do seem to, certainly you're having a trisomy 21 uh, and then another Trisomy 15. Trisomy 15 is quite a common cause of miscarriage. Um, uh, I think in your situation, you, you do seem to have um, a, a tendency to form tr to, to, to aneuploidy, that's abnormal chromosomes. Uh, um, with, with your two other miscarriages. I assume they didn't check the chromosomes in those ones. Uh, uh, I, certainly in terms of other testing, um, from what I was saying before, there, there isn't anything absolute that has to be done. Uh, but um, in, in your circumstance, I would probably uh, um, look at considering something like pre-implantation genetic testing, just that you do have a propensity to form trisomies. Uh, <clears throat> um, but I, 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 I don't think that there's an autoimmune nature to it. Uh, some women who have severe insections will have, an, uh, have uh, some problems with implantation, but it seems that you're getting implantation, so I don't think the severe insection is causing that problem. Uh, uh, I, I think from your history that, uh, and I'd need to talk with someone to be absolutely sure, uh, I think uh, it, it is that uh, you do have a tendency to forming um, aneuploid embryos. Your uterus likes to accept them. Uh, and, and therefore, if I was wanting to maximize the chance of a pregnancy having a normal chromosome outcome, I'd do pre-implantation genetic testing with IVF. Uh, okay. And, and, and looking, looking for answers. Uh, two normal pregnancies, two live births, then two miscarriages. Two years after successful pregnancies. Now age 36, same father, scared to try another. Now, looking for answers, I assume that you've had the investigations for a recurrent miscarriage. Uh, certainly, if you haven't, then those need to be looked into. It is quite possible to have two normal live births and have some abnormality that causes miscarriage. Uh, if those investigations were, were normal, 
uh, then I actually think you have a, a good chance of having a, a, a normal pregnancy quite quickly. But it's the fear and the anxiety. So if you are going to go on and have a pregnancy in that situation, you do need to be in a supportive environment. And I would normally consider sort of once a week scans in your situation uh, and, and you know, trying to get you through to the stage where you're not likely to miscarry. I think you're likely to get there. I know it would be very frightening though. <coughs> so, uh, Linda, an embryo missing chromosome 18, will it miscarry? Um, there are embryos, so that's a, a, a what we call a, a monosomy 18. Uh, so instead of having two 18 chromosomes, you've got one. Generally, uh, monosomies won't result in an implantation. Uh, um, I mean, there are some monosomies that do implant, particularly Turner syndrome, which is a monosomy with a chromosome. Uh, X chromosome in a female. So generally a chromosome 18 won't implant and if it does it does implant it's not going to result in a, 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 a non-grade pregnancy. Um, so uh, yes the answer is it, well it won't it probably won't result in a pregnancy. So in suggestion for a current second trimester loss with genetically normal babies and no obvious issue with mum, missed miscarriage, not spontaneous. Okay, so um, I assume that the pregnancy gets beyond 12 weeks and after that the pregnancy, the fetus dies. Um, and so that, and those, those babies had normal chromosomes. The most common cause of that happening is actually abnormal chromosomes. Now some of those uh, are related to autoimmune conditions. Um, uh, you say that there's no obvious issue with you. Um, um, so look, I, it, there is something in your situation going on with the implantation process and the embryos not getting enough blood flow to survive. Um, I don't, if they were chromosomally normal in those situations, then I'm not sure I have any absolute answer to that. Um, a small group of these people do have an undiagnosed autoimmune condition and and in the past I have tried heparin in this situation with aspirin as you would do in, in antiphospholipid syndrome. Uh, this, is a, this is a situation you have that is quite similar to what happens in antiphospholipid syndrome. Uh, so I, I wonder whether it's an autoimmune condition. Uh, I don't have any absolute answer with it without a lot of results in front of me. I'm sorry. Are there any more questions there? So I've been asked here what are my thoughts of immune therapy and recurrent uh, uh, pregnancy loss. I've all, I, I, in terms of the immune therapy, certainly there's a place for uh, for um, heparin um, in antiphospholipid syndrome uh, and that's certainly been proven, heparin with aspirin. The thought is whether that's, whether clexane is the right one to do and there is some thought that the old-fashioned unfractionated heparin is maybe a little bit better and it may be something in, in, in the makeup of that that does. But certainly when there's a proven autoimmune condition and, and recurrent miscarriage, certainly there is a place for, 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 for clexane. Um, in, I mean, I'm currently in Sydney and in Sydney they have uh, people who use a lot of prednisone to treat um, 
uh, so-called so um, uh, uh, killers, uh, t uh, natural killer cell infertility and the Bondi protocol. Um, it's there are risks of using too much prednisone in pregnancy and it blocks out the normal process of immune tolerance to a pregnancy. Uh, these studies with, with high dose of prednisone haven't been um, proven um, um, in, in, in all cases and it's not been subjected to randomized controlled trials. So there's a, quite a lot of a discussion about the validity of using prednisone, particularly in high doses up above 20 milligrams a day. Um, <clears throat> the, um, whether you, by using a small amount, you may actually improve the outcome of the implantation is possible, but uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to prove. There are a group of women where we can't find an autoimmune, but their history is such that they seem to be behaving that way, and it's possible that a trial of steroids may help in their situation. Uh, uh, but over my career, uh, the, there have been very few, and I remember all of them. Uh, the use of antibiotics, uh, I said when we talked about um, the use, uh, the use of an endometrial biopsy. Certainly there is a use for antibiotics if there's evidence of an endometritis, and that's certainly uh, a, a, a well-proven treatment. It's possible into the future that people will look at changing the uterine flora with the microbiome, and you hear people talking about that. Uh, but routine antibiotics, unless you're treating something specific, probably are not uh, going to make any great difference for recurrent miscarriage. Okay, can I explain PROM and what's the best way to prevent it? Now PROM I assume is what you mean is premature rupture of the membranes. Um, so when I was talking earlier on about the cervix and being incompetent, if the cervix is, is weak and can't hold the pregnancy in, the membranes will prolapse down through the cervix and the cervix will open up. Then the, the membranes will, won't have adequate nutrition and blood flow to maintain them healthy and the membranes break. So in women with rec recurrent, uh, with, with cervical incompetence, they will, their, their cervix will open early and, and, and they will um, uh, have early rupture of the membranes and then will lose the pregnancy. So in, in that situation, the treatment of premature rupture of membranes is to put in a cervical suture to, to hold the cervix and act in, as a cervix, putting a suture around the cervix. And that can be put in early uh, in the pregnancy, or some people will put them in before women get pregnant. Uh, so that's the, the way that you can prevent that. There are some women who will rupture membranes later on in the pregnancy associated to low brain infections, uh, and, and, um, and, or, but it's usually associated to the dilatation of the cervix first and then the membrane rupture second. Uh, if it was related to infection, that's, you would need to uh, look at that prior to pregnancy and work out what's going on. Oh, now. Uh, so there's, so the next, where am I now? Uh, thanks for your, all your questions. I'm sorry we can't take any more. <laughs> Apologise if Dr. Benny doesn't answer your questions right. Please feel free uh, to contact us on Helpline. I think that's my thing to close now. Anya, okay? Thank you for listening to me. And thank you for all your questions. It's appreciated. Sorry I can't give answers always because it's a situation that there are sometimes aren't answers. Thank you, uh, Dr. Benny. I'm really sorry, everybody. We are now at uh, at eight o'clock at the end of the session, and I know oh, there really? are sorry. there are many more questions. Um, there's a couple more on the screen, uh, Dr. Benny. Do you think you'd be able to just answer those 
two more and then we can close off. Okay, so so from where you are on the screen, so there's, uh, I've done click same program. Ah, so after the premature optomy and range, any blood test I should monitor should, or ask to be done to redo over time. 28 years, one ectopic, four recurrent miscarriage. So far, all results normal. Last blood test done six months ago after just three losses. Um, well, are things that could have changed in that time maybe thyroid function, so it's probably worth getting that done. Uh, it, I would probably look at what's happening in a normal cycle to see whether you're getting adequate progesterone production and the cycle's acting, working normally. Uh, the other tests generally don't change, although some women will develop antiphospholipid later, so it's possibly worth repeating that. Um, at what point do you tend to recommend surrogacy as an option uh, for a patient with unexplained recurrent miscarriage? The, the decision to go to surrogacy um, is, is, is very complex um, and um, it's sometimes hard to prove that it's a uterine problem. Certainly if there's evidence of a strong uterine problem that's stopping uh, the pregnancy uh, implanting, uh, and you have evidence that there's normal chromosomes on those embryos, uh, then, then there is a place to consider surrogacy. Some women won't, couples won't accept that, others couples, that's what they want to talk about early on. So I don't have a set rule when I discuss this. It depends on the cause. If there's a definite uterine problem, then that I would go to surrogacy quicker than if there was no explained problem in a normal uterus. Uh, what are my thoughts about acupuncture for the current pregnancy loss? The, I'm not aware of a randomised controlled trial relating acupuncture to recurrent pregnancy loss. Uh, and, and even with infertility treatments, randomised controlled trials find it hard to prove that it makes any difference. I do know, however, that some women having acupuncture do get a lot of emotional support from that and feel a lot better. And certainly, if you can use acupuncture to actually treat the soul, um, then it will help the over the management of overcurrent miscarriage because I think there are some elements to well-being, general well-being and immune response in the uterus. Uh, and if we can make people feel well within themselves and they get a good response, then there's a, certainly a place for considering acupuncture. But it's hard for me to say that it absolutely makes a difference. I think it's treating you. Uh, which allows the pregnancy to, 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 to thrive, okay. flourish, okay? I think, is that all I need to answer? More questions, but uh, I think we've run out of time now and you've answered all the questions um, on the screen. Yeah. I've just got one comment here that I'm going to now put through, which looks like it's from Dr. Shelley Riley. Uh, she's just made a general general comment. Thank you, Shelley. Um, well, that's fine. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Relevant to, uh, and really, mm. yeah. I mean, I, um, I mean, I think I would actually go to the GP after two now, because I think by waiting for three, you cause so much of emotional distress. And, and as I say, the guidelines now are looking more at two miscarriages than three. So uh, that's the only difference I would make. That's a very valid comment. So thank you very much.
Dr. Benny, thank you so much for your time tonight. And thank you, everybody who's joined us tonight for asking all your wonderful questions. And look, I'm so sorry if we didn't get to all of them, but please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, so thank you again, everybody. Yeah, if people want to, I mean, maybe you can send me some questions and I could write an email comment or something like that. And we can do that if they wanted that. That'd okay. be great. I am please send them the through. Moment, so I don't really Okay. Okay, bye, thank you. Good yeah, night. Bye from Australia. <laughs> Take care. Bye bye. Good night. Thank you. Uh -huh.